All right. With me today, it's our mortgage broker. So uh, kind of excited. This is pretty pretty cool to, to hear all the different things because he's way smarter at this stuff than we are. And uh, so with us today is uh, Jeff Zikafus, the managing partner of Hamilton Realty Finance. Jeff, thank you for being here. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so let's just start off with you went to SMU, right? Yeah. So I I grew up in Houston, mm -hmm. came to SMU in '94, and I've been in Dallas ever since. Okay. So, are you pretty excited about the ACC move? Or I'm, I'm very excited about the ACC move. Are you concerned about Florida State trying to get a loan to get out of the ACC? I'm very concerned about that. I don't know how long the ACC is going to stay the way it is now. <laughs> You know, part of me, though, was interesting. Part of me was, you know, the, I, I think the top-ranked non-Power 5 group yeah. gets the 12th seed in the new playoff. Yeah. It's like, we kind of probably could have gotten that most years if we would have stayed in the American. But that's, the, yeah. but I'm definitely happy to be in the ACC for sure. Yeah, that was, you know, when I saw them trying to get out. You know, I mean, a lot of people had an opinion on the Florida State thing. I thought it just sucked from a standpoint of there's, you know, they punished a bunch of kids because their quarterback was hurt, essentially. If it was Clemson. They would have gone, you know, and so, but, um, you know, I, I was like, golly, I, like I was excited. I, I always wanted SMU to come back to the Big 12. I was like, that just makes so much logical sense. But uh, I mean, I will say I'd rather be in the ACC than the Big 12. Yeah, I, I, can I see think that's that. more exciting. Yeah, no, um, the Big 12 got really weird over the last two years. I'm glad we added the Pac-12 teams. I kind of always, there was always rumors in the past for Texas Tech to go to the Pac-12. And I was like, well, we kind of, we could kind of fit in that. We're out in the desert. Everybody else is out in the desert. But we ended up just getting the desert teams to come to essentially the, the Big 12, which now has Cincinnati in it, which is so odd to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have Houston back, though. Yeah. That's the one thing I'll miss. SMU and Houston always had a pretty good rivalry. Yep. I'll kind of miss that a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of cool BYU's there in Big 12. That, that'd be a great road trip. Yeah. That's what I'm excited about the ACC is I think I'm going to take one away game every year to go check out these venues and yeah. they're great ac ac academic schools, too. So, yeah. like, take my kids with me and it's yeah. like a preview for maybe a future for them. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, I got, man, I had a I had a road game picked out next year, and I got gypped on it so bad because of conference realignment. But, you know, we played Oregon at home this year. That's it was, right. It was a great yep, game. Yep. We, we barely you lost it. We should have won that game. should have won that game. And we were supposed to go play them out in Oregon this year. And I had it all set up, man. And we were going out there, and then they – they had a buyout. Oregon had a buyout, and because of the realignment of conferences, and they're no longer in Oregon State's conference, they still want to play their Civil War game, and so they bought out of our contract to play in Oregon. Do you know so how much that was? I think it was like twenty five thousand dollars or something. Oh, so it was, was a like, lot. Okay. No, it was it was something yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. But anyways, so well, let's just kind of talk about so. You go to SMU, you get a degree in finance, and, you know. Yeah, so, so I I really, I thought I was going to be a stockbroker, honestly, my whole yeah. life is what I wanted to do. And I got an internship with Smith Barney that first summer after freshman year in college. Mm -hmm. uh, went there, hated it. My parents actually forced me to quit after four weeks because I was so miserable. And <laughs> then one of my mom's best friend's husband was a mortgage banker in Houston. Okay. Didn't know what it was, had no clue what it was. And he said, why don't you come over here and and work here for the rest of the summer? Next thing you knew, I fell in love with commercial real estate finance and have been doing it basically ever since that summer. Yeah. And when I graduated from college, I was on the lending side and worked for GE Capital for a while and Prudential and then kind of moved the mortgage banking side in 2013. Explain GE Capital to me because... I haven't got into those levels of things yet in, in my real estate career. And when I think of GE, I think of them like um, as a manufacturer, but they actually have a whole capital side. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know if these stats are exactly right. I mean, when I was there, GE had, I think, 13 different businesses. Yeah. With GE Capital being one of those 13 businesses. And within GE Capital, there was 28 businesses. <laughs> and ultimately, GE Capital is kind of what really heard GE in 09. It's really interesting. It was a very conservative company. And, um, and you know, like everyone in 06, 07, oh, I guess 06, 07, they started getting a little out of the comfort zone mm -hmm. on the capital side and got a little too aggressive and 09 came around and, and hurt them. 
And does GE have, they have equity and debt platforms? Not, no longer. I mean, they're out of the business, but yes, then they did both debt and equity. Actually, just right around the corner, we office in the Bent Tree Towers over here, to Bent Tree Tower, where both debt and equity was there. Yeah. 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 Was it uh, Greg Hamill that you worked there? I don't know either. Greg Hamill. There was a John Hamill. Okay. Um, but there I don't was, know Greg Hamill. There was a guy I used to call on to try to get the leasing on some of their assets. Okay. and the, But anyway, so then you leave, you're at GE Capital for what, six years? And yeah, then, that sounds right. From like 98 to 05, mm-hmm. I think was, is what it was. And, yeah. and then left to start a, an office for CW Capital here mm-hmm. in Dallas. Wasn't happy. And then went to Prudential. Okay. For a while. Okay, um, and that was on the on their debt side too. Placing, that's right. Yeah. Was it placing debt for their because they own a lot of assets? So I was considered a generalist. Uh-huh. So I was able to originate debt on the life company balance sheet side, mm-hmm. as well as agency and as well as CMBS. Okay, all right. So and what what was it at office assets, multifamily stuff like that mostly, or we did a little bit of everything. Yeah, on the life company side, I mean CMBS, we did just about everything. The thing that I actually did a lot of. On the life company side, that was a little unusual. Self storage. We did a lot of self storage portfolios, yeah. larger portfolios, kind of around the country. Yeah, but yeah, we did a lot of industrial, a lot of grocery and retail product like that. Gotcha. So then you you kind of went to the acquisition side, and you went over to Dunhill for a little while. Yeah. So you know, oh nine, I got caught up in well, actually twenty ten, got caught up in layoffs at Prudential. Mm-hmm. Dunhill was a a, a big client of mine at Peru, like we did a lot of loans with them on the CMBS side and they were nice enough to let me kind of hang my hat there for a little while and help them do a lot of different things. And then, um, when the lending market came back, I went to go work for ladder capital actually in this building, we office in this building (laughs) here on the third floor, I believe. Um, and then Randy Fleischer was always one of my best mortgage banking clients over the years as a lender. Mm -hmm. At that time, he was selling his company to JLL. Yep. And he'd been trying to get me to join the mortgage banking side for years. And finally, the stars aligned in 2013 and kind of started the same day he and his team did at JLL in 2013. Okay. So what um, what was the difference from going to, from like a prudential side to a JLL capital market side? Like, I mean, the big difference is just more entrepreneurial. I mean, you're yeah. really, you work for a company, but you're really self-employed, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's the big difference. I think the thing that was frustrating, I mean, I'd go back to the GE days too. When you work for a group like Pru or GE, it does matter what you do personally, mm-hmm. but a lot of how you compensate is dependent on other divisions within yeah. the company. So GE, for example, the light bulb division has a bad year. That affects your bonus, even if in real estate you have a great year, right? Yeah. That's the big difference from working like that back to just you know, being a mortgage banker, you're yeah. basically your own boss and control your own destiny, which, so, which I like and appreciate. So y'all would work a lot with the investment sales team guys, right? If they're taking out a portfolio to kind of be there to provide debt quotes on it and stuff like we that. And, and We would, yeah. we would. And were y'all placing equity as well at the time? We would, yeah. yes, that's correct. Yeah. What, uh, what do you like better, debt or equity? Uh, debt. Yeah, for sure. Equities. The thing that I don't really like about equity, and I don't mind saying this because I say this to my partners and, and everyone, is, you know, on a debt assignment, you hire me. Yeah. We negotiate a fee mm-hmm. and we close it, and there's no argument over that fee. Right. The challenge with equity, in my experience, is you hire me for equity. We come up on a fee. I introduce you to an institutional equity client. They may not agree with that fee. Yeah. And they may try to skinny that down. And then, by the way, when it comes time for you to do the second or third deal, you're arguing over if you're getting paid anything and what that is if you are getting paid. Yeah. And so it's more transactional in nature Yeah. versus I don't like to work that way. Yeah. I'm more relationship in nature. Yeah. And I just don't like how that that tends to be. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it seems like equity would be, I don't know, there's just a lot more minutia to it, right? Like, uh, I think when someone's going to give you equity versus debt, I think they got to really, they want to get into the guts of you a lot, you know? And, and so, well, it's a big challenge that we have. I mean, like 
back when we were doing more it, equity in general is harder right now. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are on the sidelines, but I mean, even though I don't enjoy it, I would still do it. Yeah. But even when it was plentiful, I mean, that's the first conversation I'd have with someone like you, Jeremy is mm-hmm. like, okay, you know what you're signing up for, right? Like yeah. you're hiring me to find you an equity partner. Mm-hmm. Okay. You realize they're going to be in your business. Yeah. And are you comfortable mm-hmm. with that? And I will tell you, Probably a third of the time mm-hmm. you get a term sheet, exactly the terms that the client wants, and they start seeing the fine print and how much how much decision making they have with you. And they don't like that. And they end up not taking the deal. Yeah. And they just go back to their old ways and just deal with their family and friends they've dealt with in the past. Yeah. That happens a lot. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, we we just executed JVAs with two separate groups and it uh I don't know. I mean, it, it, there's, there's a lot of nuance to it, you know, uh, that, you know, some stuff I just kind of had to agree to and some stuff I fought and, you know, but well, you got to be proud of that. I mean, this market right now is not easy yeah. to find that. So you, kudos to you that you have those two options. That's yeah. great. Yeah, no, it, uh, and it, it, you know, it worked out great. We, you know, we got, you know, we're fixing to close our first with one group. We've closed three with the other group already. You know, one of them showed up at the end of the year and it was like, hey, we got to close in 17 days and they're going to underfinance it, but we got to close in 17 days, but we're going to get a phenomenal deal on it. And okay, great. There's the money, you know, so, so that helps too, right? It helps with the scalability of what we're trying to do with our platform. But I could see, you know, it's just uh, equity just seems like just such a, I mean, to your point, like you could get, you could get an equity guy, uh, deal all the way to the finish line and they get a hundred page JVA and they're like, Whoa, that's that, that happens a lot. <laughs> yes. That has happened a lot. Yes. <laughs> Cause it's, it's pretty deep. I it mean, I, I had a lot of long weekends reading documents yeah. and understanding what I was getting into and, uh, and it's expensive. I mean, negotiating a JVA can be 40 grand, 50 grand, I mean, you know, so, more yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, okay. So y'all are at JLL. You and Randy are running JLL Capital Markets. Are y'all? Well, I wasn't running. And Tim Jordan and and Randy were running it during the time I was there. And then in 2016, you know, Randy's, I guess I'll put me in that group, but like they kind of earned their freedom back um, with JLL. And and then Randy and I left kind of together and started Hamilton the thought was, you know, in a little bit what you were saying earlier about teaming up with some of the IS guys, in a world where a lot of people were consolidating, mm-hmm. we felt like maybe there was a, a little more, there was a niche for a boutique firm. Yeah. The thing that we dealt with a lot of JLL that was frustrating to me as just a debt mortgage banker was there's a lot of our clients that you can appreciate, especially on the industrial side, there's mm-hmm. a lot of clients that their principles of industrial, but they also lease and manage third party as well, right? Mm-hmm. Well, JL does that as well. Yeah. And there was times where they were hiring, like if, you know, let's say your brother, Mercer companies or whatever, right? Like yeah. they, JL would have hired some of, or stole some of his employees. Yeah. Why would he hire me to do his debt? Like yeah. my company still has employees. We dealt with some of that stuff. Yeah. There was also just a lot of, always trying to cross sell to different divisions and you know we just wanted to just do what we do best which is debt and equity yeah you know we also have a lot of clients too that are they want to stay under the radar yeah they don't want to be in the public eye and if they hire a bigger firm they feel like the whole world knows what they're doing yeah and so they kind of like the boutique part of it where it's not the whole world knowing what they're doing yeah so we just felt like there was a niche to to go boutique when everyone else was getting bigger and it's been, I mean, it's it's worked out well. I mean, we've been happy with it. And frankly, we didn't lose any clients when we left. Yeah. And frankly, we picked up more clients since then because of some of the stuff we just I just mentioned. Yeah. No, it's uh I think that's probably what we like working with you guys because you are a boutique. I don't think I'd walk into JLL Capital Markets or whoever now new marks capital markets or whatever and be like, I, I don't know, it just that doesn't fit me in a way. And um, so I, I think that's probably our attraction working with you. You know, we will knew 
Randy, I guess, from some deals that y'all done with Holt Lunsford or something, or I, when when Will was a Holt Lunsford. So that's what that's how we got a hold of you. He was like, hey, because we we've been kind of always messing with this idea. We're like, we got to have some kind of debt fund. Like we can like there's there's a, there's an opportunity oh. for that stuff, and we've actually started placing it. And it's like, okay, now we got to just really do a fund because this is too hard to do <laughs> one by one deal. Yeah. So did you mentioned, I mean, Hutton Lunsford was one of the ones that came over and started Hamilton as well. With oh, okay. Us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he worked with us for a little while. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I just he, saw He was a partner with us. And yeah. then Holden Lunsford just went off on his own. I don't know if you saw that. They're starting a, a PE group for logistics operating I company. did not see that. No. Yeah. yeah. So I think they own a 3PL though already. So it's probably just really growing that platform probably. It's mm-hmm. probably been pretty good for them. They, they own... All kinds of businesses. Yeah, so it's a great uh, family. Yeah. A great family. Yeah, no, they've they've done very well. So so you and Randy go start Hamilton. How many guys y'all start with in the beginning? It was just I guess there was four of us. I guess it was we had an analyst and then the three partners. So it was yeah. just four when we started. Yeah. Yeah. How many of y'all have now? That's a good question. We're up to I guess we so we have an office in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. Randy's full time and as, as you you were there last week as yeah. full-time in Tahoe, right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and actually Nevada is a weird state that you actually have to have a license for what we do. Yeah. And you need a residency there to get the license. Yeah. So he has that license and he's he's there in Nevada. Yeah. In Tahoe. And then we have Curtis Jaggers in our office and Jason Perry in our office. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of analysts. Yeah. That's what is funny. We were, me and Rainer having brunch the other day. I was like, the, uh, you know, we'd always gone to the Hard Rock in Tahoe. And it just changed the golden nugget. And I was like, so what, what happened with the hard rock? And he's like, oh, yeah, we used to have a, we used to have a note on that thing with those guys. Yeah. So he told yeah. me, I guess, the family, the patriarch of the family passed, passed away or away. something. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so, but uh, it was, uh, it was just funny. He's like, oh, yeah, I have a note on that. So. Yeah. yeah, we had a mezzanine note on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's see. What are you seeing now, trends within? I mean, do you work? mainly in Texas or do you get outside of Texas? I mean, I know your firm does, but like you specifically. I mean, I would say that the, I would say most of the clients are in Texas, Mm -hmm. but I would say 50% of the assets are in Texas and 50% are outside of Texas. Gotcha. Okay. So you're kind of going wherever the client client goes. That's right. Gotcha. Is there different trends in different states versus Texas that you see? When you leave, especially Dallas Mm -hmm. and and Texas, you, you realize how spoiled we are here. Yeah. Like our economic drivers here are just so much better than around the country. Yeah. We're spoiled here in that we have phenomenal banks that are willing to do commercial real estate loans. Yeah. When you leave, it, when you get a hold of a local bank in some other state, mm-hmm. they're just not as aggressive as they are here. Yeah. And and it, it makes it more difficult to do a bank deal when you're not dealing with a Texas-based bank. Yeah. It's 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 a lot tougher. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, what about Life Coast? Do they punish other markets tougher? Versus uh, I Texas? mean, I, I would say life, life companies definitely are national in scope. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't say they punish certain states or anything like that. I mean, they just they want to stay in the major cities around yeah. the country. They're not real like even in Texas. I mean, they're not going to want to go to. They have an apartment deal in Tyler. They're not going to want to do that or something like that. They want to stay in the, you know, they call them secondary markets. We call them primary markets here, right? I think Dallas hopefully is becoming a primary market in some people's eyes. It's always funny that that's secondary. It's not New York. (laughs) It's not San Francisco. It's not LA. It's not Chicago. (laughs) But who would? I mean, I'd rather be in Dallas right now than Chicago and San Francisco all day long. Yeah. Um, So that's changing. But yeah, the life companies are you know, national in scope. And I mean, everyone loves the Sun Belt states. I mean, yeah, they, they just do. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you just, you made me think of something. Did you see in San Francisco that Brookfield foreclosed on a loan? They made a Veritas for 464 million for like 2,150 there's, apartments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of that that's about to happen. Well, you, okay. So like, Everybody talks about how bad office is. Like office sucks, office sucks. But I feel like I see the most, I hear the most loans going back in multifamily and then the most fraud of operators in multifamily. I mean, that's interesting. I see a little bit in multifamily from the standpoint that if you did a value add bridge loan, Mm -hmm. short-term loan 
a couple of years ago and you might not necessarily hit your NOI budget and now cap rates have gapped out yeah. 150, 200 bips. Yeah. And you had a strike price on SOFR LIBOR that was really low and now that's gone. Yeah. I think that kind of scenario is starting to pop up a little bit. But yeah, I mean, the office, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel in the next two years I, on that stuff. I don't see it at any time. Well, here's here's what I... Th- Here's something I've always thought about that no one talks about in office, but like, I don't think office completely is flushed out until probably about 2030, maybe 2031. And that's because think about all the people that signed multiple floor plate 10 year leases before COVID. Yeah. In 18, 17. Yeah. So yeah, 19. Yeah. And when they come to renew, they're probably going to renew, but they're going to give you back a bunch of floor plates. And, you know, if they have five, they're going to keep one, one and a half, maybe two and give you three back, and you're not backfilling that stuff. That's fair. I mean, I would say my office clients who have leasing arms would say that there's momentum out there for office leasing for space that's like 10,000 square feet and lower, some of the mm-hmm. smaller users. But those big blocks, it's there's just not a lot of tenants looking for that stuff right now. Well, so my thought on the big blocks is big blocks are occupied by very mature companies who are now having to deal with employee retention. And so they're going to these hybrid work schedules. So they're going to scale back their footprint because of this hybrid and hotelings type stuff. And then to your point, 10,000 under, I think there's going to be velocity because those are growing companies. And so they're going to grow. And like, I mean, we're already kind of maxed out in this space, right? right? You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we're stuck here for a couple more years, but we'll, we'll definitely probably go to a larger footprint. So, but that was kind of my, you know, I used to represent Children's Medical Center on their industrial stuff. And that's what, you know, I was like, how many floors do you have at Trinity Towers? And you're like, seven. And he's like, man, we're, they don't cut that, you know, yeah. <laughs> at some point. So I was just like, man, that's just one user. Well, I mean, think about that. I mean, that's in Dallas too, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. and we're, I mean, we're better than most cities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can imagine, you know, what's happening like in New York and places like that. Yeah. You know, someone brought up a good point. Recently, too, it's like the tax bases and the tax dollars that aren't going to be paid to the local authorities is going to start affecting services, I would think, at yeah. some point, right? Yeah, yeah. Fire department, police department. Yeah, that's what I mean. And and we don't, you know, like New York, I mean, they got a lot of vacancy, you know. That's going to be, and you can't, most of them you can't convert to to residential. You know, it, it's just, they're trying, I mean, they are some, I mean, yeah. I'll say when I was at Prudential, we did, we did a conversion of an office tower to multifamily downtown here in Dallas. Yeah. And it didn't work out so well because ceiling heights. Yeah. Cause you, once you open and expose that ceiling, then you got to put the plumbing in through it for each yeah. one. And, and it's just, they, they were low ceiling heights compared to, yeah. you know, something that's new. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that didn't go over very well with renters. Man, I, and that's the ha- that's the problem with a lot of the office. It's it, just especially the older stuff that you're probably that's struggling. Yeah, yeah, the stuff that needs to be converted can't be converted. Right. It's um, the golly, I couldn't imagine going through a project like that. Like, how long did that take? How long did it take? The, I don't. I the mean, sponsor gosh, to do that it? was oh seven. <laughs> I don't know about oh six. I don't even remember. It's, it. I don't remember. I mean, getting a make ready done on a class B industrial building takes thirty days right now. I can't imagine doing something like that. You know, it's an interesting stat though that I'd like to give our contractors is the Empire State Building was built in thirteen months. What's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "Is that true?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's true. They built it in thirteen months." <laughs> I guess there wasn't as much labor shortage there as yeah. it was today, but uh, so. But what do you? So what are you seeing in multi right now? Because you y'all do a lot of multi. You see, are you seeing? We, do, we, we probably do more construction multifamily than yeah. we do perm multifamily, yeah. uh, just because we don't have agency. Yeah, we don't have our dust license or, or Freddie Mac license. But I mean, the construction stuff we're still getting deals done, mm-hmm. albeit at lower leverage than we were before. Yeah. You know, there's a real, just in general, this isn't, it somewhat ties to multifamily, but in general, like there really is a big bifurcation on loan size. So 
you know, 20 million and under, Mm -hmm. if you have that size alone, it's still readily available to get debt. There's still a lot of the smaller regional banks around here that are active. Yeah. You start getting some of that larger scale stuff, you know, over thirty million dollars and multifamily construction falls in that. It's it's a lot harder to yeah. find that loan. Yeah. And it's it's just a handful of people that can write that check and do that. So they have the ability to delever from what they were doing in the past and get recourse. And, you know, it's it's you know, it's definitely harder to find that out there. So a lot of banks now too are pushing deposits. You know, they're like yes. they're like, oh well, you know, we'll do your loan, but you need to move all your deposits. My argument to that is with these banks is like, you know, do you understand the undertaking that it is for me to move my accounts? And so this is this happened to me. We were doing a deal with a bank, I think this was in twenty one. We closed two deals with them on the same day, on a Friday. And um, they were, throughout the whole thing, they were pushing hard for my operating accounts. I was like, uh, you'll get the operating accounts for for the properties, right. yeah. but you're not getting Matador's operating accounts. And um, and I told them, I said, look, you know, I go, you can cut me a $50,000 check. That's probably what it will take for me to move it. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? I go, because it's going to take me and my employees a full quarter to go through the the butt whipping that you're fixing to lay upon me. (laughs) And, and you know what happened? We closed that Friday, that Monday, I called them with another deal. They go, we're out of commercial lending. I was like, wait a second. You wanted me to move my deposits to your bank and you can no longer even service Mm -hmm. me. So now when a bank says that to me, I go, sure. You just got to guarantee that you'll be loaning on commercial real estate. And they're like, oh, well, we can't do that. I go, well, then what's the benefit of me coming over there? I mean, you don't even know if you can provide me service. Right. So they don't, you know, they give me I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a topic of conversation a lot. Yeah. You know, we, we're still able to find some banks that don't require that. Yeah. They all, all always want to have the conversation, but post-closing, can we talk about it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think what's funny is, you know, some banks are like, I want... 25% of the loan amount in deposits to do a loan. Yeah. You know, and, and historically, there's always that rule of thumb that, you know, the per, the guarantor needs to be net worth 100% of the loan amount and mm-hmm. 10% of the loan amount in liquidity. Yeah. I'm like, a lot of my clients aren't even 25% liquid loan amount. Even if they wanted to give you all their deposits, there's not enough to satisfy that. They're real estate I think, guys. I think, I, think, I, think that, I think that is always funny um, when I hear that comment from some bankers, um, which they'll probably, they say back to me, well, that may not be a client we really want to bank anyways. I'm like, that's fine, but yeah. you're missing out on a lot of good deals yeah. out there. I mean, these are real estate operators. Like, that's what I always, you know, the real estate operators are always broke. Like, you're always continue. you're, you're cycling money constantly, you it's, know. It's true. I mean, over the years, I've seen a lot of, as you imagine, being on lending side too. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of balance sheets that are hundred million net worth guys with mm-hmm. eight hundred thousand liquid. You right. know, I mean, it happens. I think the other thing too that helped the deposit conversation a little bit back last spring mm-hmm. is when the two banks failed. Yeah, especially around here, we have a lot of smaller banks, somewhat new. Yeah, not really household names. Mm-hmm. You know, like I want deposits. And then after that, it was like, okay, like I will help you convince Jeremy to give you some deposits, but not more than 250,000. Yeah. I mean, why, why, why would you do that? Like, yeah. it, like <laughs> someone they don't really know they've done one deal with. Like, I mean, yeah. you have to be careful. And that, when I said that to some bankers, they're like, I, I get that. Like, I understand that. Yeah. Well, what can you do? You yeah. know, I mean, I'll take 250. Okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> they come off a million really quickly. Okay. Yeah. I'll take 250. Yeah. So keep that in mind. You can always use that argument with yeah. some bankers, especially if it's not a household name. Yeah. So, you know, I thought it was interesting though. We were, we were working on a deal this year and we got a term sheet from a very large bank and they, they gave us a term sheet. Our equity partner, you know, we kind of went back and negotiated that because our equity partner had some pretty large deposits there. <laughs> and they came down. I remember the deal. Yeah. Yes, I remember they came that. down. Yep. And then they just called one day and said, hey, we're out. Yes. Like, we're yeah, done. I know. It was so funny. This bank literally had a luncheon 30 days prior. 
Texas is strong. We're open for business. <laughs> Just whoop. Yep. Yep. Um, but yep. uh, we did get a deal done with those guys, though. That's uh, right. And it, they've been great to work with. So it's, it's been good. They are. But um, and I'm sure we'll do more loans with them in the future here. So whenever they get back online. But it was just it was just so funny that, you know. And that <laughs> bank is always one of the better interest rate banks, too. Yeah. Like, when, when they're in. And they love industrial, too. And yeah. so they can be pretty aggressive on industrial. Are you seeing anybody bank office right now? I will tell you, I haven't, I haven't asked the question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you just not take the assignment? Well, there just isn't any assignments to take. Yeah. I mean, I, all you're doing with the existing, like we had a loan that matured. It was a debt fund deal that matured and it's performing last year and we just negotiated a two-year extension i mean that's yeah. what you're doing is you're just trying to extend what you have yeah until and I that's start. part of i mean that's part of what we've seen i mean you know last year was for sure slow for our our business yeah mainly because there was no everyone knows there's not a lot of acquisitions happening yeah. last year okay yeah. but what people forget is i have clients that have executed their business plan mm -hmm. and they're usually ready to go to perm financing. Yeah. But they may be in a five-year fixed rate, three and a half percent rate with the bank. Right. I mean, I tell my client, just stick with it. Like, yeah. hey, like I, don't pay that off. Like, this yeah. doesn't help me out to say right. that, but like, you should just stick with it. What we've done in some cases is we just added a B note at today's rate. Yeah. To get, if, they want, if they need a little more dollars and need to get some cash mm -hmm. to their clients, just add a B note to the existing A note. Yeah. And then blend it, it's still a pretty good rate. That's yeah. kind of what we've done more of. We did that more last year than just paying off the bank and yeah. doing a perm loan. No, it's a, uh, you know, it was slow. It was pretty slow for us last year, too. I mean, we, the year before we bought 56 million, last year we only bought 29. And then out of that 29, I think we did loans on one, two, three. I think we, about 50% of them were owner financed. Yeah. And there was a point, in December, where we were in title on six buildings and only one had financing on it. <laughs> it was, we just started asking the question. Yeah. We we made a nice little yeah, marketing, marketing piece to yeah. go with our, our LOIs. It's like, hey, consider owner financing this to us. You make this much on your money. You know, we're right. usually buying from older one-off sellers. They're kind of like, well, that's something to do with the money, you know? So, so that's, that's where we, I would say, figured out a bunch of deals that we could make last year. So, but I, it seems like it will loosen up this year. And, you know, a lot of people keep asking, you know, Hey, well, we're going to wait till the bottom. I, I kind of feel like we've bottomed on pricing. Everybody's like, Oh, well, the prices are going to come down more on, and I'm speaking specifically in industrial, but like, I don't, I feel like we've kind of come down to that. If it's been, if it was just say 150 a foot for a building in Brook Hollow. It's now 125, but it's it's going to be holding right there. And do you? I mean, I obviously I tend to be looking at the correlation with interest rates, mm -hmm. and interest rates are lower than they were, right? So right. I I agree with that. Yeah. So the um the ten the five and ten years kind of been fluctuating the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I will say, like I said, so I said this morning to someone. You know, eight weeks ago when the Fed came out and mentioned maybe three cuts this calendar year, mm -hmm. you know, there was, I mean, December was positive. Now, I wouldn't say there was a lot of activity happening. Yeah. There was a lot. Of, I had a lot more calls from clients that kind of been on the sidelines saying, okay, I have a loan maturing in May, June of this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should take it out. Yeah. I'm feeling better about things. But treasuries pop back out. I, I don't, I, I've been so busy. I haven't seen what happened today. Yeah. But they're back out 25 bips in the last five days. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I feel like all that optimism maybe in the last week has gone away a little bit. So what is driving that? Like, what pushes that factor back? It's forth? inflation. I mean, yeah. recently, it's the inflation, right? Yeah, like, right. it's it's the inflation's not coming in as much as they thought. And then what's going on in Yemen and the Houthis and them with going, you know, pirating the ships, if you will, and yeah. rerouting the ships is, I mean, that, that's only going to make inflation worse, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit of that that's is is why that's happening. That being said, on a positive note, I would say that the CMBS world, mm -hmm. they there was a couple deals and that went to securization last week, and the bond buyers love the paper and spreads have ripped in thirty 
35 bips yeah. in the last five days. So, I mean, I've got actually on your your deal that we're in the market right now, yeah. you know, we we got, we're asking for a 60, 65% leverage, mm-hmm. five year, I got a five year IO quote at 250 over the five year treasury today on a five year CMBS deal. Yeah. That was three, that was high threes a month ago, that spread. Yeah. That's how much the five years come in. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah. if spreads are coming down, then... Uh, I mean, usually, and in, in, when you go back, I'm just thinking back to, you know, starting in 98, typically when indexes go up, mm-hmm. spreads come in. Okay. That's what was really unusual about last year mm-hmm. was that wasn't really the case. And what I just said was happened in the CMBS market is kind of the first time we've seen that in a while, okay. which takes it back to the historical norm. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, indexes have gone out the last week, but spreads have come in from a CMBS perspective. I'm not saying that for life companies or or banks or anything like that, but so that that's good. So do you think when last year when spreads were going up and then, I'm sorry, when indexes were going up and then spreads were going up with it, was it just fear? Is yeah, that, that's know? what happens, yeah. right? All right, yeah. yeah. So, well, so then that tells you that there's, you know, people that are starting to have more confidence in the market than if they're bringing their spreads in. I think so. So I think so. So that kind of gets me just like, so outlook for 24, you know, like sounds like it, it's, it re- it's going to get back on track. It really just comes down to the Fed. And, yeah. and if we have three cuts or if we have any cuts, if we have no cuts, I don't know what it's going to be like. Well, I think there's going to be cuts because Trump is the most likely presidential candidate and they're going to do everything they can to make prop Biden up some more. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, historically in our world though, like election years, there's really not a lot of movement up or down. I mean, it's kind of stable. Yeah. Normally you like that. And where we are now, you kind of don't want stable. You kind of want it to come in a little bit. I hope, I hope that happens this year. Yeah. It just really depends on inflation numbers. It just really does. And the feds next announcement, what they're saying and talking about. Well, Okay, so one question I always like to ask, like, what are what are some resources that you like to look at on a regular basis for your world to just kind of stay in tune with everything? And not- yeah, I mean, the, so the guy I follow the the most is J.P. Conklin yeah. at Pensford Financial. Yeah, if you're not on his mail list, you should look it up. Go to his website. He sends an email out every Monday morning, mm-hmm. which is kind of an update of what happened in the past, what he thinks, like the past week, yeah. what he thinks going to happen. He's also a huge, we started this conversation with football. Yeah, He's a big football fan, so yeah. he has a lot of analogies to football and a lot of stories to football. Yeah, Unfortunately, he's an Eagles fan. <laughs> um, he's a big North Carolina fan, though. Yeah. He lives in Charlotte. <laughs> but he's definitely my go-to when I'm just kind of looking at predictions and interest rates and yeah. what the Fed's saying, he's got a pretty good pulse on what's happening. Okay. So mark that. Yes. Go check that out. That's right. So what about any books you like on commercial real estate or just any books in general? Well, like? not, not, I don't know if I've ever read a commercial real estate book. That's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, I, I really like non, nonfiction. So yeah. like, uh, you know, Ben Mesrich is one of my favorite authors you know, all like the accidental billionaire. I'm blank on the guy's name. The guy that wrote Silk Road, that author is, um, it's not Ben Mesridge. It's, uh, I'm blank on his name, but he, I, I like a lot of the nonfiction stuff yeah. that's written out there. Although I will say I have not in the last, I've probably started two books in the last 12 months and haven't finished them. I haven't <laughs> found a good nonfiction in the last 12 months. So yeah. if you have a recommendation, let well, me know. Well, I just bought one and uh, it's written by Henry Cisneros. The, he was the, yeah, yeah, I remember Henry. Yeah. 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 And cause we've kind of, we've kind of made the commitment to go down into Houston this year and, and buy buildings. So we're now more Texas triangle focused okay. and, um, I, he wrote a book called the Texas triangle. And so I'm just, it's, I bought, I bought a big hardcover. Okay. So I'm going to set it in here and I just bought it on Kindle too, but I just started reading it. You know, so what's it about? It's just about the economics of the Texas triangle okay. and how powerful it is. Uh-huh. Like just talks about the GDP of it compared to countries and just, you know, I'm only about two chapters into it, okay. but it's, but it's, you know, I was like, well, you know, everything I kind of do works in this area, the land development deals we do down in temple, that's all, you know, down there and in, in this and in this and we're adding Houston and it's like, well, 
I just want to learn everything I can about it. So it's just kind of interesting. I kind of like nonfiction stuff too. And then a lot of it ends up being like Texas history type yeah. stuff. And and so, but I like a lot of biographies about cool people too. So he'll be curious if he gets into the light rail, like if he gets yeah. into that book, if, if, if it's, or the, I'm not, not the light rail, but like the speed, the speed, train. the speed trains yeah. between the triangle, if that ever, ever happens. Yeah. And, I, I just think about how long would it take, I, how long would it take to get easements? All the way down, people. I, I, I mean, know. you're dealing yeah, with some people. I, I mean, know. I'm doing this land deal right now in Temple, and I got nine owners on one piece of property and four on another. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you're going to run into that yeah. just constantly. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. brother said no. He said he wants more money. And mm. <laughs> so, but, well, all right. Well, let's wrap this up. Any other thoughts, opinions, hot sports opinions? What are the ponies going to do next year? Had a good season. Kind of, Kind of blew it in the bowl game, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I could tell a story, but I can't tell a story <laughs> on this public thing. But I think, I think there were certain situations that happened. Is why. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I'm excited for next year. Who knows what we expect next year? I mean, yeah. you know, we have a lot of transfer portal guys on the line, both offensive and defensive line. Yeah. So we're beefing up for that. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit worried about on the in the wide receiver room on yeah. uh, um, what that's going to look like. But I mean, we'll be competitive. Oh, we'll yeah. be competitive. I, I, I mean, to me, I mean, I'm hope SMU fans out there don't get upset with this. But I mean, if we're bowl eligible, I'll I'll be happy because we have a hard non conference. We play T C O BYU. We play BYU. BYU mm-hmm. I think comes to Dallas. Okay. We have TCU BYU, and then we had some. I forgot we had someone that just oh Vanderbilt. Just, uh, I think they belled on us, kind of like what Oregon did. Yeah. So I think we're looking for a replacement for that one. Yeah. But yeah, it's we have Florida State coming to Dallas next year. Oh, that's cool. That'll be fun. Yeah. Hopefully they stay in the conference a little bit longer. They're getting rid of the hilltop, though. That's what... That's what I know. My, I, fam- my kids are disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't go to a game last year because the hilltop's not there. Yeah, it's all... They like to go and just run around with their friends. And yeah. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Well, it's... Uh, it's it, you know, it's, it's kind of like an adopted team for me since my nephew's in school there. So I track them and, and whatnot. So, but well, all right. Well, anybody listening, if you need a mortgage banker, this guy, he's kind of the ninja at it. He, he knows what he's doing. Reach out to him. We'll have his contact in the show notes, but thanks again, Jeff. Thanks for being yeah, thank on. You. And thanks uh, for having me. We'll do this again. Yeah. So, appreciate it. All right. Anytime. Thanks.